Regulators around the world are starting to crack down on cryptocurrency. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if crypto investors had some sense of which coins and tokens regulators are looking to tackle, because then they'd be able to prepare accordingly. Unfortunately, there has been a noticeable lack of regulatory clarity around cryptocurrencies, and the United States takes the cake in this regard. That's why today I'm going to do an in-depth analysis of what SEC Chairman Gary Gensler has said in his recent talks about cryptocurrency regulations and what this could mean for the crypto market. Before we predict the SEC's future plans, I need to make sure I don't get banned. Nothing in this video is a suggestion for what to do with your crypto portfolio. This information is purely for your education and entertainment, if you didn't already know. If you didn't know, you're probably new to the Coin Bureau. My name is Guy, and my mission is to create the highest quality content about crypto. This channel is where you'll find the kind of knowledge that could change your life. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, market moves, tutorials, technical analysis, financial history, and basic economics. If you're sick of the fiat rat race, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to make sure you find your way back to this place. I know you've got plenty of other things to do, which is why I've left a few timestamps below just for you. You can use them to skip ahead, but watching the whole way through is a great way to stick it to the Fed. So, now that you're up to speed, let's see what's been going on with the SEC. If you've never heard of the SEC, lucky you. Anyway, allow me to enlighten you. The Securities and Exchange Commission is a regulatory agency in the United States which is meant to do three things. One, protect investors. Two, maintain fair, orderly and efficient markets and three, facilitate capital formation. Now, the SEC does this by setting and enforcing regulations around securities. Securities include assets like stocks, government and corporate bonds, and even some cryptocurrencies. Issuing, offering, or trading securities typically requires registering with the SEC, and a failure to do so can lead to exchange delistings, large fines, and even prison time. For an asset to classify as a security, it needs to meet the four criteria of the Howey test. These are 1. An investment of money 2. In a common enterprise 3. With an expectation of profits 4. Coming from the efforts of a third party Obviously, almost every single cryptocurrency meets the first three criteria. They require money to buy, the price action of that coin or token is the same for everyone, and everyone is expecting profits. However, not all cryptocurrencies meet the fourth criteria because you can't always identify a third party who you can credit for creating the expectation of profit from a coin or token. Usually, there are multiple companies and dozens of people working on a cryptocurrency, and if there are enough third parties involved, then this cryptocurrency might be, quote, sufficiently decentralized in the eyes of the SEC, and therefore not a security. The only problem here is that the SEC has not defined what sufficiently decentralized is, nor has it clarified its stance on exactly which cryptocurrencies it considers to be securities, besides Bitcoin and Ethereum, which it says aren't. Not only that, but comments made at various events by SEC Chairman Gary Gensler have arguably made things even more confusing for crypto projects and companies looking to be compliant. As you might have guessed, Gary is the top dog at the SEC, and though it's certainly not a one-man show, it's not unfair to say that whatever he says goes. Now, when Gary took the throne in May this year, many people believed that he would be an ally to cryptocurrency because of his extensive knowledge of the industry, which he revealed with his teachings at MIT. As time goes on, however, it's becoming clear that Gary's allegiances seem to lie elsewhere, and it's not far-fetched to assume that this has to do with the decades he spent on Wall Street. I actually did a deep dive on Gary's history and the attitudes of the other SEC commissioners towards cryptocurrency, and you can find all that using the link in the top right. Earlier this month, lawmakers summoned Gary to testify as part of their annual Oversight of the US Securities and Exchange Commission hearing, 
to discuss various topics, including cryptocurrency regulations. I'll start by saying that the questions and comments by the politicians present couldn't have possibly been more polarizing, and Gary was visibly under intense pressure as a result. As such, it's worth keeping in mind that Gary's comments were likely made with the awareness that he needs to appease both sides to get the additional powers the SEC is requesting from Congress. Gary specified exactly what the SEC wants at the end of his testimony, and that's to get the funding it needs to increase its workforce by about 15%. In terms of raw numbers, that's around 600 people. Gary also pushed for more funding during his opening statement, which revealed the three areas that the SEC is currently focusing on. The first is market structure. The second is emerging financial technologies. And the third is issuer disclosures. Cryptocurrency falls into the second category, but I reckon there's some overlap. Now, though not mentioned in the oral version of his opening statement, Gary details the areas of cryptocurrency that concern the SEC in the written version which can be found on the SEC's website. These are ICOs, crypto trading, lending and borrowing, stablecoins, stocks that offer exposure to cryptos, and cryptocurrency custody. Now, the only one of these that Gary mentioned during the oral version of his opening statement was crypto lending and borrowing. And this suggests it's at the top of the list for the SEC. After finishing his opening statement, Senator Brown began firing questions at Gary about various subjects, the most relevant of which relate to special purpose acquisition companies, or SPACs. For those unfamiliar, SPACs are companies listed on stock exchanges that exist for the sole purpose of purchasing another company. This allows the purchased company to bypass the traditional stock exchange listing process put in place by the SEC. Now, the reason why this is relevant to crypto is because Circle, the company that issues USDC, announced back in July that it is planning to go public via a SPAC. Any serious action by the SEC against the current SPAC setup could jeopardize Circle's stock listing, but the likelihood of this happening seems low. I say this because Goldman Sachs happens to be one of the biggest backers of Circle's SPAC deal, and I don't think Gary would do them dirty like that. Even so, this doesn't mean that the SEC isn't going to take action against stablecoins. And this is one of the topics that Senator Toomey tested Gary on. If that name sounds familiar, that's because Senator Toomey is one of the politicians that tried to change the problematic crypto tax reporting provision in the upcoming infrastructure bill. Senator Toomey's quest for clarity continued when he asked Gary point blank why stablecoins could be considered securities by the SEC when there is no expectation of profit per the third criteria of the Howey test. Gary's response was that the Howey test alone is not the only measure the SEC uses to assess whether an asset is a security or not. And when Senator Toomey pressed him about the other criteria the SEC uses as part of its analysis, Gary couldn't give him a clear answer. The most concerning part of this exchange was that Gary told Senator Toomey that only a small number of cryptocurrencies are not securities. This is strange because Gary mentioned in one of his MIT lectures on cryptocurrency that three quarters of the crypto market does not consist of securities. Now that said, it's not entirely clear whether he was referring to just BTC and ETH, given that they accounted for 70% of the crypto market cap at that time. Anyways, another pro-crypto senator present at the hearing was Senator Loomis, and she managed to catch Gary in another contradiction when she asked him about how crypto projects can be compliant. Gary started off by saying that crypto projects should come and talk to the SEC if they're concerned about their regulatory status. Then, Gary casually acknowledged the fact that existing regulations don't quite work for crypto because they were, quote, written in a bricks and mortar time, and now we're in a digital time. As we've seen with Coinbase, going to the SEC to ask for regulatory clarity seems to do more harm than good. The TLDR there is that Coinbase wanted to offer a crypto lending service. The SEC said no, Coinbase asked why, and instead of giving them an answer, the SEC threatened to sue Coinbase. 
Now, additionally, Gary's admission that current regulations are unclear is the exact opposite of what he's been saying for months, and that's that, quote, the test to determine whether a crypto asset is a security is clear. And speaking of Coinbase, Gary briefly discussed Coinbase in his dialogue with Senator Warren, who is about as anti-crypto as a person can be. Senator Warren began by blasting centralized cryptocurrency exchanges for going down during times of high market volatility, something which I reckon is perfectly reasonable to take issue with. When she asked Gary about whether there was any investor protection for people who couldn't cash out of Coinbase because of these outages, Gary was almost giddy when he said that there weren't any investor protections because, quote, Coinbase has not yet registered with the SEC, even though they have dozens of tokens that may be securities. Now, call me crazy, but that sounds like a veiled threat, and it might have played a role in Coinbase's recent decision to backtrack on its crypto lending plans, even though that's a battle that could have been won given the circumstances. Senator Warren then proceeded to trash Ethereum for its, quote, high and unpredictable fees and how this proves crypto isn't a path to financial inclusion. It seems Senator Warren has not heard about how well Bitcoin has worked for El Salvador. And if you haven't heard about that either, be sure to click the link up there in the top right. Anyhow, the last pro-crypto politician who tried to tease answers out of Gary was Senator Danes, who asked Gary how crypto companies can approach the SEC without immediately being served with a lawsuit. Gary's response was not far off from the one he gave Senator Toomey, meaning it was unsubstantial in every sense of the word. Now, this is basically everything Gary said about crypto during the Senate hearing. And if it doesn't sound like much, that's because most of the hearing centered around other topics, namely climate change and cybersecurity. Both of these topics are relevant to crypto as well. And though crypto was not discussed within those contexts, aside from Senator Warren's off-the-cuff anti-crypto remarks, I reckon it's wise to be aware of the narratives there. This is because there is no shortage of fake news flying around about how one Bitcoin transaction does more damage to the environment than throwing out two iPhones, or whatever the current clickbait headline is. There's also no shortage of news about BTC's use as a payment method in ransomware attacks, something which no serious hacker would ask for, given that BTC is technically the most traceable currency on the planet. As I mentioned in my video about the effects of crypto mining on the climate, most Bitcoin mining is done using renewable energy simply because the profit margins are much larger with cheaper sources of electricity. More importantly, the profitability of crypto mining makes it more profitable to set up renewable energy infrastructure because you can start making money in the middle of nowhere so long as there's an internet connection. While BTC continues to be the preferred currency for those engaging in illicit activity, this dark web money has been slowly shifting to privacy coins like Monero and could even migrate completely to Litecoin once it gets its Mimblewimble privacy layer. I digress. Now, Gary had one response to all the politicians who were asking for things like disclosures relating to climate change and cybersecurity. If the investors want to see that information, then the SEC will make sure it's revealed. Now, this ties into the last question Gary was asked during the hearing, and that's what he thinks the greatest risks to the current financial system are. According to Gary, these are 1. Real estate 2. Investors chasing yields 3. And healthcare, i.e. the pandemic Now, the first and third risks are pretty self-explanatory, and the second risk is where crypto comes into play, because there's no shortage of yields to be found in DeFi and CeFi. What's interesting is that Gary specified, quote, the reach for yield not just by retail investors, but investors more broadly, which means that experienced investors are chasing yields as well. That's not all that surprising, given that real yields are suppressed by central banks and monetary policy, and crypto's free market ethos means its lending and borrowing economy actually works the way it should. This brings me to what I believe to be the biggest takeaway from Gary's testimony, and that's that we've been interpreting the regulatory crackdown on crypto from the wrong vantage point. From where we're standing, it looks like it's crypto versus banks, and banks have a significant sway over how financial regulations get made and what politicians do and say. However, banks only have power because of the people who park their money there. 
at any time, those investors could move their money somewhere else, and that power will shift to wherever that money went. From where I'm standing, it looks like all that money is moving into crypto, and Gary's comments are just the tip of the evidence iceberg. For starters, there was the NCR-NYDIG partnership to bring crypto trading to banks back in June, something that happened because banks could see millions of dollars moving off their balance sheets onto crypto exchanges. Then there's the billions upon billions of dollars being poured into crypto projects by wealthy individuals and institutions, something which is only accelerating even as regulatory risks rise. Heck, despite all the heat Coinbase has gotten lately, it sold $2 billion in corporate bonds overnight, and there was over $7 billion trying to get in line. That is not retail money. The hundreds of billions of dollars locked up in DeFi protocols isn't retail money either, and JP Morgan confirmed that the institutional appetite for DeFi is at an all-time high. That's not a surprise when you remember that Uniswap, Aave, Compound, and a whole host of other DeFi protocols have been offering permissioned pools to institutions for months now. The most convincing data point for me is the fact that Fidelity recently sat down with the SEC and pressured it to approve a crypto-backed Bitcoin ETF. In case you didn't know, Fidelity is one of the largest asset managers in the world, with over $11 trillion in assets under management. That's more than all of America's five largest banks combined. Never mind the fact that BlackRock is investing in crypto too, and it is right up there with Fidelity in terms of assets under management. This is insanely important because the SEC has asked for comments about almost every cryptocurrency regulation they've considered, and this is in line with Gary's approach to other economic issues. Now, obviously, the SEC is not asking for the opinions of small fry like you and me. They mean people with FU money. Credit to Dan Locke for that phrase. What this means is that the banks no longer have the power they once had, and though they still seem to have a foothold, their influence is fading fast. Case in point, one of the anti-crypto politicians at Gary's hearing admitted that he has never seen an industry as organized as cryptocurrency. If you need more proof of crypto's power, look no further than all the former regulators accepting various positions at crypto companies. Even former SEC chair Jay Clayton is part of the gang now, and he's been in bed with the banks for most of his life, literally, as it turns out, as his wife was the VP of Goldman Sachs. I could go on, but I think you get the point. Now, there's just one more thing that I want to talk about today, and that's the two interviews Gary did since he took the stand on September the 14th. The first was with CNBC the very next day, where Squawk on the Street host David Faber and Mad Money host Jim Cramer tried to get some more details about the comments Gary had made the day before. When asked how the hell Coinbase's proposed lending platform constituted a securities offering, Gary answered by saying there are 35 criteria the SEC considers when making that judgment, but did not explain which ones Coinbase met or didn't meet. When asked about Tether and whether USDT posed a risk to the global financial system, Gary didn't really give a clear answer. If you ask me, the answer is no. When asked about when the SEC plans to really start clamping down on cryptocurrency, Gary's response was, quote, we're doing it right now. This is somehow scary and comforting at the same time because this might mean we're in the eye of the storm. And if that's the case, the recent crash we've seen shows how resilient crypto really is. The second interview with Gary took place with the Washington Post on September the 21st, and it too sought to expand on the comments Gary made about cryptocurrency during the Senate hearing. When asked about whether the recent market dip is evidence that regulation is needed, Gary responded by saying that cryptocurrency is a highly speculative asset class and didn't really address the regulation angle. When asked about what the SEC plans to do with the extra manpower it's asking for from Congress, Gary seemed to imply that he wants to investigate cryptocurrency exchanges to make sure they haven't listed any securities. What's particularly concerning is that Gary highlighted staking on centralized cryptocurrency exchanges as one of the things that the SEC takes issue with. When asked about whether the SEC can control cryptocurrency through regulations, 
Gary seems to admit that it can't, but repeated his belief that crypto won't last long outside of the system. Gary also noted that the reason he studied cryptocurrencies at MIT is because they challenge the current financial system, i.e. the banks. Make of that what you will. Gary was then asked about the minimum amount of BTC US banks should hold when they offer Bitcoin to their clients. Now this is actually a very important question, because my suspicion is that we won't see a crypto-backed ETF until banks have built the infrastructure to hold BTC themselves. After all, they wouldn't want any more of their clients' money to end up on Coinbase. Unfortunately, Gary didn't give a clear answer here either, but it's something to be on the lookout for going forward. The last question Gary was asked was whether crypto existing outside of the financial system is a threat to the United States. He began by saying cryptocurrency is an experiment and went on to call decentralized lending and borrowing an amazing innovation. That is one hell of a 180, and I take that as more proof that there are some pro-crypto people with very deep pockets pushing the SEC behind the scenes. That is definitely good news, but there are bigger forces at play, such as the Fat F, and you can learn about what plans they have for crypto in October using the link up there in the top right. Okay, folks, that's about all I've got time for today. So, if you learned something new, let me know by hitting that like button. Better yet, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to make sure you don't miss the next flick. In the meantime, you can check out Coin Bureau Clips, the best parts of my main channel and socials delivered in bits. I also post emergency announcements there, as well as some original content you won't find anywhere else. I'm also active on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and give you detailed daily crypto market updates on Telegram. I even have a weekly newsletter that has all the tools, tips, and tricks you need to conquer the crypto market. And last but not least, you can consider picking up a hoodie or tea at the Coin Bureau merch store. All these resources and many more are waiting for you down in the description. Thank you so much if you stuck around. I'll see you all again soon, so don't you frown. Until then, take care out there. Thank <laughs> you.